trust me, I get it. You're feeling the pressure to keep your faith separate from your work, worried that pursuing your God-given dreams might be seen as selfish or misguided. For far too long, we've been held back by a world that tells us that faith and ambition don't mix, that our divinely inspired visions are just wishful thinking. But here's what I've discovered. Our faith isn't a liability in our leadership. As a matter of fact, it's the source of our strength and wisdom. When we fully integrate our leadership with our Christian values, then and only then do we tap into that unshakable divine power. The real challenge is navigating how to boldly pursue our purpose while staying anchored in our faith. And that's exactly what The Beacon Show is all about. Each week, we bring you biblical wisdom and practical strategies from true beacons, Christian leaders who are illuminating the world. And it's also that you can let your light shine brighter and brighter. I'm Tamara Jackson, and this is The Beacon Show. What does it mean to be a leader who takes responsibility in a world that is full of excuses and finger pointing? Well, today's guest has built a global ministry on a powerful principle, and his wisdom will challenge you to step up and embrace your God-given assignment with courage and conviction. My friend Alan Platt is the founder of Doxadeo, a thriving family of churches making disciples and planning churches on multiple continents. With over 40 years of experience in ministry, Alan has learned that everything rises and falls on leadership. And for him, true leadership starts with taking responsibility for the spiritual atmosphere and the outcomes in your sphere of influence. Growing up in South Africa, Alan sensed a call to ministry from a very young age. But he quickly realized that God had more in store for him than traditional pastoral work. He began to understand his apostolic gifting and stepped out in faith to plan a church that would reflect God's heart for the nations. Since then, Alan has raised up hundreds of leaders, both inside and outside the church, equipping them with the tools and mindset to transform their communities for Christ. He believes that the key to lasting revival is mobilizing the body of Christ to be agents of the kingdom in every sector of society. His latest book, City Changers, casts a compelling vision for marketplace ministry and empowers believers to see their work as worship. He challenges the sacred secular divide, I love that, and challenges the church to equip disciples who can connect Sunday faith to Monday life. So if you long to grow in your spiritual authority, make a measurable impact for the kingdom, and leave a legacy that outlasts you, Alan's story will ignite fresh passion and purpose in your soul. So get ready to take responsibility in a whole new way. Enjoy. Well, Alan, welcome to The Beacon Show, where wisdom meets faith and success finds its voice. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your schedule to be here with us today. It's such a delight and uh, hi to everybody listening in. Pray that this would really be an inspiring, challenging and encouraging time. <laughs> I have all faith that it will based on just getting to know uh, you over the last few minutes and uh, checking out the work that you're doing. Uh, it's really, really inspiring. And I hope that it will uh, equip our viewing and listening audience with some insights that maybe they didn't have prior to our discussion today. Ellen, I'd love to start at the beginning. Uh, it's always interesting to me to go back in time and hear a little bit about how our guests grew up, um, what their childhood was like, and uh, whether or not there was any inkling or nudge that I would become a leader one day. Tell us a little bit about your childhood. Well, I grew up in a Christian environment. I, uh, from the time that I could think, I felt I wanted to do something for God. And uh, I had a, an affinity for the church. Uh, and when I uh, uh, was ready to go to study, I um, did my theological studies after uh, school, and uh, many people were asking me, "So, what do you what do you want to do? You know, you're studying theology." Mm -hmm. And uh, I somehow said, "I I want to work in the church, but I don't want to be a pastor." 
<laughs> I uh, somehow felt that um, there was something more, there was something different. But at that stage, we did not have the terminology. Yeah. We did not understand that you could actually be part of the church and uh, play a role in leadership. Uh, maybe, you know, if people explain to me at that stage that there was an apostolic calling on my life, it would have been helpful. Yeah. But we shied away from those terms uh, because we, I think, fundamentally didn't understand them. Right. But I did start out as a pastor. <laughs> and I did enjoy pastoring and I still do but I also recognized that beyond just the shepherding component mm. there was a demand on my life to take responsibility for leadership mm. that's an interesting term and I've seen that across the website many times that word responsible and it instantly grabs my attention because it's not one that I see used often in ministry context. Talk to me about, I'm sure that's intentional, what the word responsible means to you and why it's so important for us to embrace it as leaders. Well, uh, just to jump onto the concept of intentional, I think our words that we use, we try to use very intentionally uh, because words matter. And uh, what we've learned over the years is if we can have people share the same vocabulary, uh, it is very, very helpful because that vocabulary positions and centers and aligns and, and brings people to a deeper understanding of what is really important. Uh, when we think about, you know, responsibility, it's a beautiful word, it's actually a combination word, the ability to choose your response, uh, which fundamentally means that you're never subject to circumstance, you're never subject to external uh, engagement, but you can always choose how you will respond in terms of your engagement. And so as we've broadened our leadership base and grown over the last 40 years, specifically within the context of uh, uh, the church environment, we've tried to raise leaders with a deep sense of not being victim, but being able to affect their environment. Uh, we often think about the disciples and Jesus at the feeding of the 5,000. The disciples were the ones that saw the problem. But they were immediately intimidated. They were immediately feeling, what difference can we make? We don't have the resources. We're not going to be able to impact or make a difference. And then they get to Jesus and the way they want to address this, this problem is let's send it away. You know, let's hope somebody somewhere else is going to address this. But then Jesus uh, speaks into that situation and, and literally says, we're going, to, we're going to give them something to eat. Same circumstance, same resource. Same context, but a different way of thinking. And I think so much of our engagement in life starts just with the paradigm of how we think. It's a mentality, posture that, that many times needs to change. Alan, how has you, you speak from a place of wisdom now after 40 years of, of serving? I'm curious, how has your concept of leadership evolved um, from when you were a child realizing, hey, there's a there's a bigger call, there's something that God is calling me to do from that moment till now. How would you say your your leadership has evolved in that time frame? Well, of course, we're on a developmental trajectory from the time we step into leadership responsibility. I think one of the fundamental things that happened in my life is to move from ego to eco, um, where, you know, initially you, you are on this success trajectory, mm -hmm. and it's important. I think, I think that season of your life is fundamental where you know, you're, you're taking responsibility and you're believing for stuff and you really believe that 
you can change and shape the world. And But a lot of it centers around your own development and your own growth and, and your own becoming of a leader. And then at some stage, it moves, it shifts into a more significant paradigm where, where success is no longer the driver, but you're asking yourself, you know, how can I serve and how can I reproduce and how can this cascade into other lives where, you know, literally it becomes an ecosystem, a, a kingdom eco framework. And so I think that's one of the, the elements that a, a leader discovers. And I personally think not every leader turns that corner. Um, <laughs> and if they mm. don't, <laughs> Mm. It, it it then becomes uh, an unfortunate reality where, where leadership serves one generation with its gift and its capacity, whereas if it does move from ego to eco, it serves generations to come. I, I, I'm intrigued by this, from ego to eco. For someone that's, you know, watching us or, or listening to this, mm. I wonder if you can give some examples. How how can we tell whether we're in ego mode versus eco mode? What does that look like on a practical day-to-day environment? Yeah, good question. I I you know, if I think back, um small things but major in their impact. You know, I started off as a pastor and so preaching was very central to my engagement. And uh, initially, I think, you know, a lot of how I prepared was really having a particular outcome in mind that when I'm done, people will say, wow, (laughs) that was was really (laughs) amazing. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I did want to you know, transition, not just from wow, but to how, mm. where people would actually be empowered, where where people would, would feel that they leave, not just inspired, but equipped. Mm. And I think it's that transition where at one stage I started to realize my preparation is no longer about, you know, having that uh, high five and feeling, you know, that, wow, you know, I, I, I really nailed it today in my communication. I went beyond that to a place where I felt I'm actually helping people. I'm, I'm investing. I'm, I'm seeing them apply and, and embrace uh, truth in a way where it becomes something that they can actually uh, engage life with and where they can see change and growth and and development take place in their own lives. Um, so that was more on the ministry side. On the leadership side, it was where I started to uh, recognize the, the strength of, of reproduction, mm. um, of investing into the next level of leadership, in a way that I could start to celebrate what God was doing through their lives and um, just recognizing whatever you celebrate, you replicate. Mm -hmm. And so not just celebrating what was happening through my life, but celebrating what was happening through their lives. And, Mm -hmm. And that started a environment conducive for, I want to say life, to flourish around me mm-hmm. um, where, where I started to see leaders rise, moving from pretty, you know, average, mediocre mm-hmm. uh, role players to people of significant impact. Mm-hmm. And um, through our journey as a ministry, I've always uh, attempted to raise leaders, but then at some stage I started to measure my own success uh, at the depth of the bench, Mm, that there was 
things. And, you know, once you start thinking in those terms, it is an incredible momentum that is released. Mm. And so um, I suppose those principles of starting to think about um, uh, the measurement is it, it changes. Mm. Uh, you know, you, you can't measure temperature with a ruler. Uh, <laughs> and initially, I think we start with the ruler. That's good. <laughs> Yeah. But then we have to go and measure temperature um, as a culture, as a as an environment, as mm. as something that you know uh, is an environment that is effectively uh, raising a uh, a thought process, mm. uh, not just within your own life but within others. You know, as I hear you sharing that, my mind literally went to scripture and, and I don't know that I thought about it this way in the past, but I'm thinking about Jesus and his ministry on earth and the disciples. I mean, ultimately what you are describing is exactly what he was doing, right? He was spending time with the disciples to get them to a place as leaders that they could continue the the work and that they could make an impact and that they could reproduce, right? So what you're describing is the model that Jesus gave us in how he led. Would you, would you agree? Yeah, I think, you know, obviously Jesus is the most amazing model of leadership that we could ever consider. And I think, you know, um, when we really study Jesus, uh, the, the challenge that he brings to us is incredible. You know, when Jesus kind of defines his own personal vision, his mission statement, he's defining it not in terms of himself. He defines it in terms of others. I have come that you mm -hmm. might have life. Mm -hmm. Just that shift is massive. In terms of how Jesus was thinking, my my mission, my vision, my 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 purpose for life is defined in how it finds expression in you. Um, if I just think about Jesus's massive legacy statement, hmm. the things that I have done, you will do, but greater yes. things. Yes. I mean, yes. uh, it sounds impossible, but but mm -hmm. that's how Jesus was thinking. That's how he was positioning. So even as he was engaging this, this group of probably very mediocre, <laughs> average, mm -hmm. you know, uh, definitely not, you know, Ivy League guys. Right. These were fishermen. These were people that the rank, the rank and file of society. I mean, and Jesus looks at them, but he puts a 10 on their heads. And that makes the big difference, right? I mean, if you put a two on someone's head, you speak to them like a two, and they normally don't disappoint you, they respond like a two. But if you put a 10 on somebody's head, it elevates the conversation. It suddenly puts you in a whole different uh, way of engagement that, that, that somehow um, extracts the potential, the resident potential of every single human being. There's so much to be learned in the way Jesus led and, and how he engaged. Uh, I mean, that can be a, a session on its own. A hundred percent. Let's talk a little bit about um, the teams that you lead and you talk so eloquently just now about the importance of putting a 10 on people's heads versus a two, um, to use your example. Um, talk to us about, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, what are some of the things that you do with the teams that you lead to get them to think of themselves as tens? Because ultimately it sounds like that's the the mindset shift that you're trying to get them to have, no matter, you know, where they think they are or whether they've had a very successful week or they've struggled a little bit, you're challenging them to think of themselves mm. in the context of a 10. So how do we do that on, on a, on a practical day-to-day -day basis? Well, um, Tamara, my journey, uh, specifically, you know, I was, I was about 
um, 10 years into ministry, starting off, you know, typically as the youth pastor and then uh, finding myself in other roles uh, of, of leadership, but taking primary leadership of a fledging church that had gone through crisis in Pretoria, South Africa in 1992. And um, suddenly just seeing the miraculous, seeing the church really starting to grow. Um, so much so that, you know, not just multiple services, but we were one of the first that initiated multi-site or multi-campuses. And at that stage, I didn't have the privilege of, of media and all the things that are afforded today. So I had to raise leaders. I, I, I had to raise uh, people that could really step into full-fledged leadership from teaching to leading teams to, you know, establishing a, a full-fledged uh, church leadership framework. And so I very early on realized that this would be part and parcel of my responsibility. And, um, I, uh, at that stage, was deeply challenged when I heard a principle called the Pareto Principle, uh, the 80-20 uh, principle. This Italian, I think he was, a uh, sociologist, that indicated that in life, in society, 20% um, of the people, you know, take 80% of the responsibility. 20% of the people... In the church, it's true. You know, I could immediately see that. You know, twenty percent of the people were just the, the core, and they were always there, and they always showed up. And twenty percent of the people, you know, gave eighty percent of the resources. Uh, and the flip side was also true that twenty percent of the people caused eighty percent of the trouble. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so the principle worked. <laughs> but what I realized, and this was the challenge. Um, and this is what I gleaned from, from that, you know, reference was many times we assume the top 20%, if I can call them that, or the core 20% were, were strong and they were um, empowered and they knew what to do and, and, and they would be okay. You know, I need to give a lot of my time to the other. And I recognized that in Jesus's life, Jesus ministered to the crowds, mm. but he invested oh, in a group. Mm. And so I took that principle very serious and said, you know, how can I give a large portion of my time investing? Um, and, and really, if you think about time, you either spend it or you invest it. Agree. Uh, spending is nice <laughs> when you spend stuff it's God. wonderful but there's not always a return mm -hmm. once you've done it it's done um whereas investing is tough but you always anticipate a return and so i opted for the tough route to say you know i'm not just gonna be with people spend time with people the nice people the you know um uh, the people that uh, it's it's lovely to be with them, but they do not necessarily internalize that which I fundamentally believe is is vital for people to grow and develop and journey and embrace and reproduce. Mm -hmm. And so um, I say all that to say in the various seasons of my life. As we developed, of course, we started planting more churches in our city, which became, you know, um, then cascaded to other cities, which cascaded to other nations, which uh, now affords us being a family of the church movement that I lead called Doxadeo, with 34 campuses across the world, all aligned in in one missional intentionality sharing one strategic framework and um that all happening without me having to micromanage because we've invested into the leaders in such a way that they share the basic dna the vision the values the strategic framework 
they understand it and they embrace it as their own. And, mm. and, and so I can walk into a Doxa Day all over the world and fundamentally feel that this is Doxa Day, although it mm. will be customized yeah. and adapted to the cultural reality of the environment. Mm. But that's really just because we spent a lot of time investing in leaders. And so my investment in leaders is, is really on, on, on three levels where we, we speak about what is fundamentally important to us from the word, the gospel, the conviction of uh, uh, the fact that, you know, this is our core message. This is what we believe can transform the world is a deep understanding of the impact of Christ. Secondly, it would be in, in the fundamentals of, of being a leader, of uh, understanding leadership, understanding um, how to uh, engender trust, how to build a community that really cares and, and, and uh, embraces one another authentically and intentionally and the third component would be the mission how are you busy raising disciples who will connect sunday's faith to monday's life mm. um how are you mobilizing a community to uh have an impact within their home their workplace and their community and then secondly how are you um, equipping the church to build bridges to the community and not walls oh. between you and the community. So how are you a community on mission? What does it look like when the church actually shows up and is incarnational to a community? And then thirdly, how can you play well in the sandbox? How do you take hands with other life-giving institutions in the society that you're in? within the community, with other life-giving churches, with other um, non-profits? And how do you actually build the, the missional ecosystem? So these are the things that wherever you go in the world and you find a Dr. Dale, you will find that this is fundamental to their understanding. The gospel, leadership, and mission are the fundamental things. And I spend a lot of time hmm. just over and over and over making sure that these three things are core to uh every expression that we have hmm. and, and i heard you as you were saying over and over and over and i think that's important as a reminder for our, our viewing and listening audience too right sometimes as leaders, the temptation is, well, I told you, <laughs> you should get it <laughs> yeah. and, and I should be done now. But, but yeah. you're saying, no, 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 no. We have to keep reinforcing and keep revisiting to keep everyone on the same page. And while it may seem like, you know, gosh, this is a waste of time because I've already communicated it. What I'm hearing from you is ultimately that helps things to work smoother. It keeps right. everyone on the same page. So it's like, are you going to pay now or are you going to pay later, right? If you don't invest the time to reinforce these messages, it, it may seem like you're saving time in the short term, but later down the road, you could see that you're having to spend more time on other areas or you're having to fix things because everyone is not on the same page. So, so, so much wisdom in what you shared that that was a, a, a masterclass in and of itself. I, I want to pull out of what you shared one piece. And, and I was, as I was sharing with you before we, we officially hit record, I was taking in a, a YouTube video that you put out uh, just a bit ago. And it was talking about this concept of connecting Sunday morning to, to Monday. And in that, uh, in that video, you were talking about the sacred versus the secular and ministry um, and the workplace. Uh, for those that haven't had a chance to, to take that in, I'd like for you to spend just a few minutes kind of helping us to understand where you feel God is, is leading you to focus your work on now and, and helping people to understand um, that they can really have an impact through their work. 
share, share with us kind of the insight that you, you got from God and, and how we can get on board. Yeah, well, this has become something that we are extremely passionate about um, because in our, in our journey, we, we did discover that many of our people did not know how to connect Sunday's faith with Monday's life. Actually, just very recently here in the USA, uh, the Barna Institute released a research uh, study that indicated that effectively 72% of Christians in the USA indicate they do not know how to connect Sunday's faith with Monday's life. Now, that, of course, is indicative of our discipleship that has failed, where we have people that come to church, they are faithful to check the box, and uh, they are, you know, congregating, being blessed and inspired, but not necessarily equipped and sent. And fundamentally, we have to start reframing our discipleship understanding. And so in our own world, in, in, in Doxa Deo, and uh, I actually, if I can shamelessly punt my book, wrote this book called City Changes, where we have um, tried to capture the principles of taking people on this journey uh, where in our discipleship model, we now see three primary outcomes. The first outcome being knowing God, the spiritual formation piece. This is normally where most of discipleship is centered. The you know, deep understanding of your identity in Christ, um, the fact that you, know, you, you can identify with his death, his resurrection and ascension in the sense that you know, you died with him, you were raised with him, and you're seated with him in heavenly places. This sense of intimacy with God, recognizing the privilege of proximity to the Father, of being led by the Holy Spirit, however you want to frame those terms, and then integrity in life. That once you understand, you know, that you are, you have a new identity in Christ, and that you live within relationship with God, it changes the way you do life. But it doesn't end there. And much of our focus is in this category when we speak discipleship. But we have to teach people that God is not just moving in them. He also wants to move through them. He wants to work in and through their lives. And so the second outcome, massive outcome that we put down as part of the discipleship framework is Loving people, uh, recognizing that you can now become an instrument of grace where God wants you to discover what it is to live with compassion, to move beyond concern to compassion, um, where you, you recognize that there's calling on your own life, that, that, that God is wanting to use you and then discovering the contribution. Um, what does it mean when you start giving your, your time, your talent, and your treasure in service of serving others? But it doesn't end there. There's another component. It's mission. It's now being on mission to impact the world. And so that's the third massive outcome that we are leading people in when we speak discipleship knowing god loving people impacting your world and impacting your world is when you start to discover that christ is lord of all so it's this new world view that he's not just lord of my life and lord of the church but he's lord of all <laughs> and unless he's lord of all he's not lord at all mm. and so he is lord of where you spend most of your time every day of your life which is the workplace. Hmm. And, and how do we in, empower you to be present hmm. as an agent of the kingdom hmm. within the context of your workplace? How do you become the Adam of God and 
and your workplace becomes your garden. If you're a teacher, you enter that classroom recognizing this is my garden. Mm. And how do I posture myself in a different way when I start to realize I now represent the kingdom of God in this space, in a classroom, in a boardroom, in whatever room you find yourself, you represent that life of Christ. And then you start to really trust God to bring the shalom, the wholeness, the completeness of God into that particular space. And that could mean that you don't go and quote scripture, but that you represent the character of Christ well, mm -hmm. the faithful mm -hmm. presence, how you inculcate the character of Christ into a community. When you carry the, the convictions of the kingdom into those spaces. And of course, Tamara, there's so much to be said about this. Because this is how Jesus sent his own disciples, right? Mm. He said, I send you as lambs amongst wolves. Mm -hmm. That must have been a scary thought. Because, oh, yeah. you know, sometimes we want to go as wolves amongst lambs. We want to go and, mm. you know, triumphantly conquer those environments. But sometimes we just go to serve and love and lay our lives down and engage in a particular way where the kingdom becomes evident mm. before we have any project or program or action that we actually do take to our world. Let's mm. become what we represent into our, our world. Wow. Um, we'll definitely make sure it's okay to make a, a, a shameless plug. We'll make sure that our viewing and listening audience can get the book because We've started the conversation here, but there's so much more that they're going to be able to gain uh, if they tune in. So we'll make we'll make sure that they have that. As you were speaking, Alan, I was thinking, um, and I was sharing with you uh, before we officially started. You know, I can remember growing up in church, been in church since I was nine years old, um, and and love the Lord and, and want to make an impact for Christ. My dilemma and struggle often was that I also felt that God had called me to business, to the, the marketplace. And I love business. And I know that it's not just me, you know, it's not just right. uh, my personal desire that is, is driving that. But I can remember, you know, having this tension because it felt like the conversation was, well, in order to really make an impact for Christ, you need to accept the call to ministry. And that, that could be, doesn't necessarily have to be full-time, but you know, you become a preacher or you become a teacher and, and all of those roles are critically important. What I love about what you've shared is that it challenges us to recognize and think about the fact that, hey, these are not two separate things uh, where I'm, I'm serving if I'm serving in church, but I'm not serving if I'm in the business or, or workplace context, that really the, the work that we do, whether we're working for another company, a, a for-profit, um, a nonprofit organization, a mission organization, or we're running our own business or, or passing a church, all of this is holy. All of this is worship if we think about it in that context. I'm curious, you know, if you were to zoom out, you know, and five years from now, how do you hope the conversation around this is different than it is today? Because I, I will tell you from, from what I can see in the conversations and the people that I interact with, um, I'm excited that you're going in this direction, but there's a whole lot of work to do to get everyone on the same page. So if you could set like a, a a five-year mini goal, where would you hope that we would be five years from now around this? Well, I thank God for the fact that the conversation is starting to find traction all over the world. And uh, actually, out of our, our church ministry, Doxadeo, we birthed an equipping ministry called City Changes that is now equipping church leaders educational leaders and business leaders, societal leaders of influence all across the world, actually in 32 nations. We have nine month programs running for people who want to orientate themselves to an understanding of how to break down the secular sacred divide. Hmm. Because 
that was never the intent of Christianity to become a program in a building. Jesus never had that in mind. As a matter of fact, over 90% of Jesus' engagements and ministry happened outside of the synagogue, in the marketplace. It's, it's something we need to, to, to discover that somehow, because of cultural uh, orientation over many, many years, we have framed the whole Christian understanding and Christian uh, interpretation within a particular uh, expression that we have designed that is now called church. I think... And I speak as a pastor. I speak as a church planter. I'm planting a church here in Charlotte, North Carolina right now. Um, I love the church. But it's fundamental for us to understand that, you know, when we use the term calling and only appropriate to ministry activity within the church, uh, it's an incomplete truth. There is obviously calling to ministry in the church, but calling is something that needs to be understood in a more comprehensive understanding that when I go to work and I sense there's grace on my life, you know, the old chariots of fire reference, you know, I feel I bring glory to God when I run. Um, this is what people need to understand, that that you are called into a particular environment and that you now represent kingdom life in that environment. And a lot of our training, equipping and discipleship, as I've said, needs to start to center around how do we help people to make that connection, to understand what does it mean and how do I give expression to that and even capture some of that reality and celebrate it when we gather in the church because what we celebrate we replicate uh, let me give you an example the saddest thing that happened very recently a man that has a massive company leads it as the ceo uh has about a thousand people employed comes to see me speaks to me and says you know um I really feel I need to start doing something for God. I, uh, and I listen to him and I hear the dualism where he's giving employment to a thousand people. He can orientate their lives in ways that is just absolutely amazing. He is in the mission field. And I realize, you know, the business community is the most unreached people group for the kingdom, because they're not understanding the calling and the purpose and the positioning. And it was a wonderful conversation for me to say, do you realize if you start to engage that environment from a kingdom perspective, how much more you can mean to the kingdom than coming to be a, you know, someone that, that's on the welcoming committee or, <laughs> or even running a small group in the yeah, church. Um, you are cold now let me help you to understand mm, that's so good that's so good it, it, as I heard you sharing that and I, I know from my own life as a, an entrepreneur one of the things that I started to recognize in, in addition to what you've shared about pouring into people and, and helping them to grow so that they can they can reproduce is also the financial aspect of it, right? When you when you employ people, you are putting money into the economy and uh, positioning them to take care of themselves, their family, um, and if they believe to pour back into the kingdom. And yeah. as, as much as as much as we'd like to think otherwise, the world that we are in needs money <laughs> to operate. Uh, the work that you do as a church planner, there's things that you have to buy. There's things that you have to pay for. You have to fund, right? So we do need money to accomplish the things that God has called us to. So those that serve uh, in the entrepreneurial context, like this gentleman that you were talking about, I mean, think about the thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars 
that he is putting into the economy and positioning others to be able to financially contribute to the kingdom. And I, I don't think there's enough conversation around sure. how big of a difference that work really means. So I'm excited about this direction that you're going in uh, and the work that you're doing to help others have this, this revelation. It, it's, it's hard to believe it. The time goes so fast every time I look up and I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that, that, that the time is gone. So I guess we'll, we'll end here, Alan. We, we've talked about uh, your remarkable journey with God over the last 40 years. What is the legacy that you hope to leave behind when all is said and done? Um, I know you want to hear well done as we all do, but for you, what, what does that look like? Do, do you think about, you know, what is it that I want to uniquely contribute to the world? Well, I um, started thinking about this when I was, when I turned 50, I'm not going to tell you how old I am now, <laughs> but I, it'll be uh, our secret. <laughs> But I uh, um, started to embrace the the uh, thought of of what am I transferring that could be transferable, mm -hmm. and um, of course my biggest desire is to see a mobilized kingdom community that truly understands mission, the mission of Christ. Actually, the two fundamental things that the early church were very consumed with was what the Latin phrase would call Imago Dei and Missio Dei. It was the image of God, it's understanding your true identity, understanding who you are in Christ, and then understanding the mission and uh, um, the mission of Christ in the world and, and how can we reproduce individuals that will uh, be able to truly deeply discover who they are in Christ and at the same time that they are called to be on mission with Christ. And so I am pouring out my life, uh, trusting that that would be the reality, that would uh, be the legacy of my life. But then I just last remark, you know, you mentioned the well done. Um in that statement, uh, Jesus mentions a good and faithful mm. servant. And through my whole life, I've never thought about building something big or grandiose or, you know, trying to, you know, have something that is uh, what has happened in our life has been phenomenal. Um, just we have the privilege of ministering in 32 different nations with many leaders in many ways, but I've never, never felt that that was the, the thing. Hmm. It was really just being faithful, finding the next step and, 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 and stepping into that and following the cloud and, and just being faithful. And so my encouragement to every listener would be, hey, just be faithful and keep your eyes open because the cloud does move. And as it moves, move with it. So much wisdom in what you've shared, Alan. Thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for everything that you've shared with our listening audience. Uh, we'll be praying for you and the work that you are doing. Um, and we'll make sure that everyone can check out the work through the website, your social media, and can get a copy of the book. We wish you God's best as you move forward with your team. Thank you so much. God bless you. And to every listener, God bless.